Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down. We're asking questions. Questions like, hey, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels? They come to me each and every week and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love to a world that's faced that don't know God for sure and definitely is in deep need of more love. Don't you think I'm going to take a look around, my friend? There's a lot of bad news out there. How can I take the good news and apply it into my daily living so that I can become a light in that darkness? I want to be a tool in the hand of God making present his kingdom, not someday, but today and every day. And that's what this show is all about. So glad you could join us. Before we get into it, big news, big news here at Daily Living. We have been broadcasting for about 11 years, I would imagine, and today, I, Father C, sit before you sicker than I have ever been, <laughs> sicker than I have ever been on camera. I mean, I am not feeling well. Now, the good news is that I went to go see a doctor and I'm okay. I mean, I'm just, I got a sinus kind of infection. I had a, a lung x-ray, everything was clear. Um, and my eustachian tube, which is, I guess, goes from the, the hole down to the throat right in here is filled with fluid. So when that happens, you can't hear. So I know I've been telling everybody, I feel like I'm underwater, but literally I am underwater. So I don't feel well, but we soldier on. Why? Because that's what we do. I know somewhere out there, there's a daily living fan that's ready for a message and I'm going to give it to you regardless of how I feel. But if it's a little kind of, you know, not up to par, up to snuff, now you know why. But what do you say I quit yipping about this and we get right on into it? Let us close our, our minds to all the distractions of the world and try to open our minds to God's world. You see, God, I hear people say all the time, well, I never, God never really talks to me. And I'm thinking, well, do you ever listen? Do you ever listen? And we spend so much time talking. How often do we listen? I mean, my father always says, God gave you two ears and one mouth so you can listen twice as much. But do we? What do you say? We listen to the word of God. We are hearing from the gospel of Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? will not both fall into a pit. No disciple is superior to the teacher, but when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove that splinter in your eye when you do not even notice the wooden beam in your own eye? You hypocrite. Remove the wooden beam from your own eye first, and then you will see clearly to remove the splinter in your brother's eye. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not pick figs from thorn bushes, nor do they gather grapes from brambles. A good person out of the store of goodness in his heart produces good, but an evil person out of the store of evil produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. The gospel of the Lord. And what a gospel it is. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back and we're going to talk about this gospel and a few other things here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm going to share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living, and together we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? 
Welcome back to Daily Living. So today we continue our journey through the Gospel of Luke. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been in what the church calls a continuous reading through the Liturgy of the Word. Sometimes the Liturgy of the Word jumps around a bit. Other times it reads in a row. So today we are picking up exactly where we left off last week. Now, I've said this a time or two, but it bears repeating. If one wants to be a disciple of Christ, then one should read the Scriptures. And if one reads the Scriptures, one should read the Scriptures in a row. Because the story builds upon the story. Very much like a building starts with a foundation and goes up. So, I got to say, religion is a beautiful thing. It's how we worship, it's how we strive to have God in our lives, it's conscious contact, it's how we come together as a community to collectively seek the hope of having God in our midst. And religion is how we do it, and it's been with us since the beginning. Ever since a mysterious character named Melchizedek approached Abraham with bread and wine, We've had religion, and like I said, it's a beautiful thing. But like all beautiful things, it has a dark side. And the shadow side to religion is this. It can, religion, it can turn into a calcified ritual that becomes very hollow as we rely on somebody else standing at a podium to define ethic and doctrine. And that, my friend, is a dangerous road to go down, but many do, and many are deceived. Now, honestly, I'm not knocking religion, okay? But I'm just simply saying that it is up to us to follow and test the path. So, let's begin. What's our path? What exactly is the path that we're following? How is our path any different from any other path? As followers of Jesus, what makes us different from the world? If someone was to ask me, hey, what do you believe, what would I say? I imagine I would start with, well, I'm a Christian, I follow Christ. Just as I suppose another person of another faith would say, well, they follow this or that belief system or this or that person. And then, of course, there's always the, you know, I'm not really religious, but I'm a really spiritual person, which I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that means, but... I guess they follow whatever they perceive is good at the time. But what about our path? What do we follow? If an alien beamed down to this planet and started asking questions in church, what would his report be when he returned to his superiors? What is our path? Well, one popular version is that our path is that we're all trying to get to heaven where we will live eternally with Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, and he died on a cross for our sins to make that possible. And that, of course, is true. But is, is that it? I mean, we're, are, we're all just waiting to get to heaven one day, trying to be as good as we can so we can make the grade. I mean, and when we sin, Jesus has that covered. Is that the path? Well, I guess sort of in a way, but I think we're missing a deeper point. So with all that said, let's talk about our gospel. I've said it once, said it a thousand times. One must read scripture in context. And to really understand this particular gospel, we got to get into the way back machine and go way back, way back from, well, before Jesus came to this world. When God lived behind a curtain in the temple and he was not happy, God was not pleased and God needed to be appeased. And the way you appease God was through sacrifice. And out of the Ten Commandments, they blew up 630-odd laws on how to keep God happy. And if you follow these laws, Yahweh would be appeased and bless his people from behind the curtain. Now, some believe that there was a life after death. Others, well, not so much. All of a sudden, John the Baptist shows up in the desert, and he starts to preach the impossible possibility of heaven on earth. Not God behind the curtain, but God in the middle of our lives, right here, right now. 
Then Jesus shows up and continues this impossible possibility as he shows us how God wants to live with us and how we should live with each other. This message is radical. This is, this is not God behind the curtain. This is God in us. Woman, the time is coming. In fact, it is now here when you will not worship in the temple, nor will you worship on the mountain, but you yourself will become the temple. That's huge. That's a seismic shift in theology. Emmanuel, God is with us. Now, as Catholics, we celebrate what we call the Eucharist. That's a Greek word for Thanksgiving. It's also known as communion. We celebrate the Eucharist at every Mass, and we believe that Jesus makes himself present in the bread and wine, becoming his actual body and blood. We call this real presence. Now, that's the impossible possibility of God dwelling in us in our faith. Now, I remember as a kid, when the priest would finish up communion, and he would, he would take the leftover host that, were, that, that had been consecrated and put them in a gold bowl. We call this a ciborium. And then he would place the gold bowl in a golden box. It was built in the wall behind the altar. We call this a tabernacle. And I remember vividly this golden box had a really fancy key. And the priest would lock the box up. And well, in my, in my mind as a child, that was God's house. And I remember thinking it was pretty small, but that's where God lived. Now, over 2,000 years ago, King Herod rebuilt the Temple of Solomon, and it was not a small gold box. It was massive, and it was built in concentric circles. And the closer you got to the middle of the temple, the more exclusive it becomes, because in the middle, of course, is where the tabernacle is, where God lives behind the curtain, very much like the golden box behind the altar in church. That was God's house. Now, I say all of that and say this. Religion can become that for us. Religion can become God's house. Some place where we go visit an hour a week, maybe we think about God from time to time throughout the week. Um, maybe we might even read some scripture from time to time. But we go visit him on Sunday, and that is our path. But that's not the path that Jesus walked. The thing about Jesus that made him so different is he did not just speak words. He lived his words. So let's consider how he lived. Let's consider his path. What does his path look like? Well, as I mentioned last week, the crowds are really starting to pick up. The healings, the miracles, uh, the teachings that, that God is not only his father, but our father. Now, of course, the religious leadership, they don't like that too much. They reject him. They were quite happy with the status quo of appeasement. God was behind the curtain, and that's where they wanted to keep him. Because if you had to get to God, you had to go through them. So when Jesus shows up and says, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, well, it was game on. And that ended up getting him killed. And I wonder sometimes... If Jesus was to show up today with the very same message, do you think it would go over any better? And I'm thinking, I don't know. I'm, probably not. I mean, but not everybody rejected the message. There were some that were very drawn to the message. They heard the impossible possibility that God is with us, and they liked that. They were attracted to the idea. They wanted that. They yearned for that intimacy. They saw the healings, they saw the miracles, and it seemed to them at least that at last God has stepped out from behind the curtain. The impossible possibility seemed very real. And they said, okay, all right, we get you. Now what? <laughs> and they're in for a real shock now because Jesus tells them something that is different than anything that anybody else has ever told them before or would follow to tell them. And it wasn't necessarily what he said, but rather what he does not say. He does not say, fall to your knees and worship me. He does not say, okay, I got a new set of rules, a system that's going to please God. No, what he says is, if you want to follow me, then you got to start with you. 
This is Daily Living on Father Chief. You stick around. We'll be right back and we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with Daily Living and what we're trying to do here. A monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with and I will send you a monthly newsletter and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com and give through PayPal and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Now, just for the break, we were talking about the fact that, well, Jesus looked at them and said, hey, you want to follow me? You got to begin with you. And you need to begin by learning how to love people that you hate. Now, that's upside down. I got to say, I don't know for sure, but I imagine if I was standing in that crowd, hearing that for the first time, if I was looking for direction as to how to follow Jesus, maybe get closer to God, and I heard this, I, I imagine I might turn to my buddy and say, did he just say what I think he said? I mean, really? Stop judging, and you will not be judged. Stop condemning, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I mean, we've heard this all our lives, and we're used to it. We lose sight of how truly radical that message is. One moment, I'm sacrificing animals so that the smoke will appease God. Next moment, I have this wandering carpenter preacher out of Nazareth saying, I am the smoke of appeasement. And not only that, but what I choose to do with judgment and condemnation, what I choose to do in regards to forgiveness is exactly how I will receive forgiveness. I mean, think about how empowering that message is. I can have intimacy with God who will teach me the character of God like a father teaches his son. Loving others the way that God loves me. Loving others when they're unlovable. Forgiving others when I don't want to forgive them. Showing mercy when they don't deserve mercy, which of course, I guess it wouldn't be mercy if you deserved it now, would it be? Jesus is not saying, follow me on my path. No, he's saying, walk with me on my path. So that's, a, that's a huge difference. That's an impossible possibility. Heaven on earth, God is with us. And that is our path, my friend. And then, like any good father would, he warns us of the danger. It's a subject that is worth much more attention than it presently receives. Jesus told this parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not they both fall into a pit? I mean, this is a warning of the danger of false teachings. Once upon a time, there was a man, and he came to the podium. And he talked about his deep abiding faith in Jesus Christ as he clutched his Bible. And he was a gifted orator. He was a good talker. And he talked about his personal struggle to bring a Christian ethic to a fallen world. And he convinced many people that he was a sincere, righteous leader that was worthy of attention. And he was supported by almost all of the religious community. Only a few rejected him. That man's name was Adolf Hitler, and he deceived an entire nation. Now, thankfully, we don't got a whole lot of Hitlers running around these days, but we do have a lot of false teachings. You can see that dog and pony show all over your television set on Sunday mornings. Miracles for sale. The more you give, the more you will get. And they do it in the name of Jesus, and it is very, very sad. Because, you see, the problem with selling a miracle is this. If somebody actually believes that if they write a check 
to support somebody's ministry, they're going to receive a miracle. And all they really, really got to do is really, really, really believe and the miracle don't happen. What message does that give? It tells them that the impossible possibility of heaven on earth is a scam and it doesn't exist. And they've been led into a ditch by a false teacher. Because when you're listening to unsound doctrine, you risk becoming unsound yourself. So again, what is our path? Jesus is making it very clear throughout the Gospels that our path is not in heaven someday. Our path is right here, right now. Jesus is promising you and me, the Holy Spirit, to dwell in you today. The Spirit of truth that will teach you all things. So they say, okay, Lord, we get that. Now what? Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but not perceive the wooden beam in your own? Oh, my friend, we could do an entire show on nothing but this. No, no, we could do a month-long series on nothing but this one line. You think I'm kidding, but it's true. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? It's called hypocrisy. Mark Twain once wrote, we are all like the moon. We all have a dark side that we don't want anybody else to see. And that is true. And often what we hate in other people is what we ourselves are hiding. Hypocrisy. But you see, here's the problem with hypocrisy. If no one should teach or preach unless they are faultless, well, then there would be no preaching or teaching in all the world because we're all fall. We're not all faultless. We all fall. Scripture would not be taught. Sin would not be condemned. And my friends, we all have a tendency towards exaggerating our good qualities while hiding our flaws. The Bible calls this tendency hypocrisy, but we all do it. Whether it be conscious or subconscious, we try to put forth a better image of ourselves than really exists. Consequently, the outward appearance of our character and the inward authentic reality often do not match. This is true for many of us. I know it's true for me. I imagine if every Tuesday everybody knew exactly what everybody else was thinking, what would you do on Tuesday? I think I would make that my day off. I mean, seriously, I think most of us would run and find a closet, wouldn't we? And remember, we're talking about the path here. Jesus is making it very clear that this path, as we walk along, needs to be a path of consistency, practicing what we preach. Nothing teaches more effectively than consistency of conduct. And that old saying, you know, just do what I say, not what I do, th- that, that's wasted air. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. A good person, out of the store of goodness in his heart, produces good, but an evil person, out of the store of evil in his heart, produces Evil, and then here it is. Okay, if you're looking for a bumper sticker theology, this is it. Okay, for from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. Hear me when I say the greatest test of a person's character has to do with two things conduct and conversation. Jesus says, Every tree will be known by its fruit, and out of the abundance of our heart. For the fullness of our heart, the mouth speaks. These principles of who we follow, who we choose to listen to, and how we speak are foundational in our walk along the path. The only way to truly honor Jesus is to trust Jesus. And the only way you trust Jesus is to walk with Jesus one day at a time. And this religious notion that if I'm baptized or born again or go to church on Sundays, then I'm living in the Spirit, well, that can be a dangerous error. Scriptures tell us they will know us by our fruit, which begs this question, my friend. What fruit are you bringing today? Are you repenting? Do you believe in your heart in Jesus 
and walk with Him daily? Do you strive to live a holy life or do you live in the world? Have you overcome this world or has this world overcome you? If your tongue is ungodly, then your heart is graceless and unconverted. You want to follow Jesus? May I suggest it all begins with you. And, and let me just make this clear. You're going to fail. I fail. We we all fail. I, fa I fall every day. My tongue escapes me. I might all of a sudden wind up in the middle of some kind of gossip or, or get angry. And I, In fact, I am sure. There, there's at least a few people out there that are watching me right now who know me really, really well and are thinking, that guy's a hypocrite. And you know what? They'd be right. Thank God for the path. And thank God for the cross. My friends, I invite you this week to do some soul searching. What fruit Am I bringing forth in my life these days? Are they fruits of the Spirit or something else? Do my insides line up with my outsides? Does my conduct and conversation line up with He whom I claim to follow? If I was brought up on charges of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? Only you would know that, my friend. How are you going to answer that question today? You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.